Gallaudet University presents. Opportunity to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. And it is my great pleasure to do so. Thank you for those of you who are here in person for coming, those of you who are watching us via the internet. Thank you to all of our audience members. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. David Plout. He's a professor in the Department of Psychology and Computer Science and the Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition at Carnegie Mellon University. He's renowned for his pioneering contributions to the discipline of connectionism and connectionist computational modeling in conjunction with his empirical studies. He investigates computational models as a new microscope into the human brain function and the impact these functions have on higher cognition. He looks at typically and atypically developing populations. In a series of truly ingenious experiments, he has studied the effects of damage to computational connectionist networks as a new means of exploring ways into the brain function and its impact on cognition. And in particular, he has studied how we can retrain damaged networks with the ultimate goal of designing more effective, effective strategies for patient rehabilitation. A good deal of his work has focused on word reading. He looks at normal skilled readers as well as brain damaged patients with acquired reading disorders. We are extremely grateful and delighted that he is part of our Science of Learning Center. He's a recent member this year to the Visual Language and Visual Learning, VL2, this year. Here he looks at the types of knowledge that are used in skilled deaf readers, especially the role of fingerspelling and orthography as a gateway to deriving meaning from the printed text in skilled deaf, deaf readers. We are especially delighted that he is here today and we look forward to his talk. Thank you very much for coming, Professor David Plout. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Loanne, for that very kind introduction. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today about uh, some of my research. Um, I won't be talking specifically about uh, reading acquisition in deaf individuals today, but I'll be talking about other research um, that provides a way of thinking about how the brain becomes organized for visual learning, through visual learning, for recognizing different categories of things. Um, over the past 10 or 15 years, um, there have been extensive findings suggesting that the brain has very dedicated specific modules for particular kinds of visual stimuli. So Nancy Canwisher and colleagues have identified what is now called the fusiform face area that is supposed to be dedicated for face recognition. There's a visual word form area, a parahippocampal place area, and so on and so forth. Um, and these, pro this proposal um, is supported, as I said, by a lot of different kinds of uh, data. Now, I'm going to focus on two particular regions, the fusiform face area and the visual word form area. And I'm going to propose that um, there may actually be a different and a better way of thinking about the roles these areas play, that there may actually be a greater mingling of functions uh, between these areas, even though faces and words as 
domains are unrelated um, because of certain constraints and pressures on brain organization and brain learning, um, they become intermingled in interesting ways. Uh, and uh, I'll present both some computational work to illustrate that as well as some uh, empirical work testing predictions of the theory. Um, just to review some of the relevant findings, um, the fusiform face area is an area, um, this is a functional imaging data, uh, identifying it in the right hemisphere in the fusiform gyrus, which is up underneath uh, basically the temporal projections from the occipital lobe down into the temporal lobe. Um, if you take a view of brains kind of from the bottom, you can see here in yellow and orange areas specifically responsive to faces as contrasted with an area that's a little more medial. It's actually on the parahippocampal gyrus instead of the fusiform gyrus and called the parahippocampal place area that responds to buildings, scenes, and such. Um, again, much stronger here on the right, in the right hemisphere, uh, although you can see there's some specialization on the left. If we look at electrophysiological measures, evoked potentials, um, we can find a particular signature of face processing much more strongly on the right, that little negative deflection there at about 170 milliseconds after presentation. It's slightly present on the left, but again, not nearly as strong. If we also examine patients, people with brain damage to this particular part of the right hemisphere, um, they exhibit selective impairments in face recognition, so-called prosopagnosia. Um, so that their recognition of faces is much worse than recognition of other kinds of objects. Um, it can only, it often is bilab, caused by bilateral damage, but can be caused simply, uh, solely by right lesions. Uh, and when they encounter individuals, they have to use other kinds of cues, hair color, shape, body shape, and such, to recognize individuals, even potentially family members. Turning to words, there is some very similar kinds of findings. An area now in the left hemisphere on the fusiform gyrus, selectively responsive to orthographic stimuli, particularly word-like orthographic stimuli. Um, so here are, this is again a somewhat distorted view of the brain in the left hemisphere up underneath where you get a selective response to words hear words relative to consonant strings. Again, electrophysiological measures reflect this negative deflection at about 170 milliseconds, much stronger in the left hemisphere now uh, than in the right. And brain damage uh, that affects this area produces a relatively selective impairment in word recognition. Here, patients are unable to read words presented, read them in parallel, and rather have to resort to a kind of piecemeal letter-by-letter -letter reading strategy uh, in order to recognize the words. These findings seem to fit with this basic story that there are these dedicated modules, a face module in the right hemisphere, a word module in the left hemisphere. But what I'm gonna to try to suggest is that there are commonalities in these findings between these two domains that suggest there's a relationship between them, that they are not independent, as, as you might think. So first of all, if you actually look at the localization, the positions of these selective areas, at the bottom here are the coordinates, uh, three coordinates in space. Um, apart from the hemisphere, which is negative for left and positive for right, the actual coordinates in the brain are quite similar. That is, the face area and the word area are in essentially homologous regions, essentially corresponding regions in the two hemispheres. If you look in each of these domains, you don't see purely unilateral activation. You see strongly bilateral activation. So here are data for words 
actually various letter strings varying in how word-like they are. And what's plotted, let's just focus on this, is the proportion, the, the degree to which such stimuli engage the hemispheres relative to how much words do. What you can see, though, is both hemispheres are involved, even in the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere is not as selective as the left but it is still engaged uh, to largely the same extent, suggesting that our word processing is not as strongly lateralized. If you look at the electrophysiological data, here the foci of these signals are bilateral for objects like cars. They are much stronger left lateralized for words, but there is a right uh, hemisphere peak. And for faces, it is stronger on the right. But again, there's a strong signal on the left as well. Again, suggesting a degree of specialization, but nothing like independent modules on the two sides. There's no question that reading, representation supporting word recognition have to develop in the early years as children are learning to read. But the same seems to be true of face recognition. So, Data looking for evidence of this fusiform face area uh, in uh, relatively younger children, five to eight years old, can easily localize the place area in green, but find no evidence for a face specific area. It's only until 11 to 14, roughly, that you start to see here in red a specialized region in the right hemisphere. Um, but in fact, in, it isn't actually uh, show, doesn't actually show all the mature characteristics seen in adults, uh, even at that age. And so just like words, there seems to be a protracted development in the neural organization for faces. Um, also, of course, across individuals, there's a, uh, effects of the degree of activation of regions that depend on experience. It's not wired in from the beginning in any respect. In reading, this is less surprising, but just to illustrate it, um, what's shown on the left are for English readers get strong responses to words and word-like strings. Um, of course, for Hebrew readers, that's not the case. It's Hebrew strings, uh, letter strings, that are producing the strong response. So the selectivity is obviously sensitive to your experience with particular types of orthographies. Um, the same turns out to be true in the face area. It's not solely responsive to faces. So if you train people to distinguish um, these like creatures, they're called greebles, where sometimes the distinction's quite striking, but other times it's rather subtle, exact shape of the kind of ear-like things. Um, if you train people over many sessions to tell whether these are the same or different, what you find in the neural response in this area, in the right hemisphere on the right side of the slide, is over at the very beginning, it responds to faces and not to greebles, or not very strongly. But over the course of training, the response of this, quote, face area to greebles increases. And in fact, the response to faces decreases somewhat. So that by the end of training, when subjects are quite expert at greeble processing, this area is as responsive to greebles as it is to faces. And that's actually true in both the left and the right hemisphere. So rather than thinking of this area as face specific, it seems to have learned visual expertise. We have great visual expertise in faces. But if we also become greeble experts, then uh, this area also participates. Now, these parallels in the findings suggest that the domains, the, the pressures that give rise to this organization are not independent. They're not separate modules. But the same kinds of pressures are, are causing a kind of parallel organization between the two. One proposal for one of the important factors that govern their organization comes from work of Rafi Malach and colleagues where they identified the locations of, in this case, just for, work, for faces, 
um, in the right hemisphere. Uh, and what you can see here uh, in the middle slide, in yellow, are the regions in cortex, now cortex having been flattened uh, in display, the regions in cortex that are responsive to faces in yellow and uh, red compared with buildings or houses in blue. Now, it's a little hard to tell, but these white dots show the lines between earlier visual cortical areas, V1, V2, V4, all of which are retinotopically organized. And you can see their organization because if you see this uh, little annulus, these circles, the peripheral information is plotted in green here on the right, and the central information is yellow and maybe magenta. And you can see those in those areas here that the central, the, the, the regions that are face selective overlap with the information from central vision, whereas the regions for object, or in this case house and uh, building recognition, overlap with peripheral visual information. In a follow-up study that compared words and faces together, they found essentially the same thing. So here, the regions that are face selective are the yellow outlines, and the regions that are word selective are the magenta outlines. And you can see that those regions fall entirely within the blue region, where, which has central visual information, compared with the peripheral information in green. Malach and, co and colleagues proposed that the reason the visual word form area and the fusiform face area are where they are in the brain is because they both, as domains, place particular and extensive demands on high acuity information from central vision. To recognize different faces across expression and to interpret expression requires very fine details in vision. To be able to distinguish two words very quickly as we're reading when those, the words can differ by single tiny visual strokes, again, requires very fine visual information. So the brain has organized the areas responsive for these categories to be as close as possible to the information that they need to use. So we can understand the organization of the brain for these two regions not as specified as dedicated modules, but rather as the consequence of a system that's learning to code this information, but where that learning is subject to certain constraints and pressures, certain biases on what, how information should be represented and organized, okay? So we envision the system as, as uh, it composed of a hierarchy of levels from early visual information all the way up through object representations. But throughout that system, certain representations need to cooperate with each other. Certainly the information of lower level information that needs to contribute to the object representations needs to be able to connect with it. Okay? So information can, be, can communicate best when it's when you have direct connections between them, okay? Some kinds of representations need to cooperate to support each other. Others may be requiring incompatible kinds of descriptions are actually in competition. So the kind of description, the kind of visual object that a word is, is very unlike a face. The, the kind of representation you would have to code different faces is really not very well suited to code differences among words. And so at a basic level, words and faces as representations are competing. On the other hand, they both want to listen to central visual information. They both need high acuity information. And as I've shown you, that information is localized in a particular place in each hemisphere. 
So in a sense, they're competing to become represented in that part of cortex so that they can be close to central information. The problem is they can't both be there because they, they are incompatible. They require different kinds of descriptions. So the, the hypothesis is that the organization that we observe is the consequence of that cooperation and competition, a kind of fight between the face representations and word representations that partially gets resolved by having them in somewhat different, in different hemispheres. That is to say, word representations have a strong pressure to communicate with other language-related information, which is primarily in the left hemisphere. And so an organiza the, the basic organization makes sense. Words are mostly on the left, faces are on the right. However, because it's the result of a kind of optimization, the organization is only partial. The words are mostly on the left, according to this idea, but partially on the right. Faces are mostly on the right, but partially on the left. Okay? And our claim is that that kind of organization actually can explain uh, the empirical findings that we observe and lead to certain predictions um, that otherwise seem a little strange. We'll get to those. So first of all, I want to illustrate how those principles can actually play out in a mechanism that's recognizing words and faces to account for the partial specialization of the two hemispheres. So the basic organization of the mod model, it's not literally what I'm showing here, but the basic organization is that visual information is processed by the two hemispheres, mapping up to, through lower level visual information, mapping up to these levels of representation in the fusiform cortex in both the left and right hemisphere, and that those are kind of what I'm calling object representations, the visual representations of faces and words. Those have to further project to meaning representations, potentially phonological representations. Um, there's a particular pressure for language-related information uh, to be able to activate that in the left hemisphere for words. Now, to illustrate the principles, I'm going to describe briefly a fairly simple simulation using very simple versions of those tasks, but where the tasks illustrate the basic constraints that face and word recognition place particular demands on central information, central vision. So the face stimuli look like this. Um, they're very abstract, of course. But these, you can see that they differ in terms of subtle features like the eye, spacing between the eyes, the length of the nose, the height of the mouth relative to the nose. Um, each of these would correspond in the simulation to a different individual that would have to be identified. Um, houses are like this. They differ across the whole visual field, not just in fine details uh, in central vision. And words, of course, are composed of letters, mostly falling into central vision. Again, a given, a given pair of words, say dig and dog, uh, might differ only in a few small strokes uh, in central vision. So these are the kinds of inputs the model is going to get. Um, and it's going to learn to differentiate these. Now, one of the properties of early visual information is that central information from central vision versus peripheral information is kind of laid out across cortex, spatially separated. So these are uh, plots showing the degree of activation as you move from central vision toward peripheral vision, going from like blue to green to yellow to orange, you can see the neural responses move across the surface of the cortex on this axis. Um, by contrast, if you look at responses that differ not in eccentricity, not in distance from the central vision, but in the angle that the information has um, from the horizontal, then you find that as information is changing in angle, 
the response varies along a different dimension. So um, one of the characteristics of cortical organization is this sort of relationship which can be roughly characterized as polar coordinates. That is, instead of coding information in terms of kind of horizontal and vertical coordinates, like the retina might do, it gets translated into cortical areas in terms of a representation where along one axis, you're coding information that's different distances from central vision, and along another axis, you're coding the angle that that information makes with the horizontal. Um, in the earlier slide I showed you, you can kind of see this. So the vertical, the visual areas, the lower earlier areas are kind of cutting across this way. And you can see for each of these, the central visual information is kind of all being kept together. It's all on one side of each of those areas. And the peripheral information is all on the other side. So in the model, we're going to approximate that. We're going to take our stimuli and we're going to convert them into polar coordinates so that one axis codes how far the information is from central vision and the other axis codes the angle that that makes uh, from the horizontal. Um, and that, uh, that allows the central information to have a kind of spatial proximity. It's near each other. All the information from central vision is near each other in this way. Now, the model has to recognize different faces, different houses, different words, um, across some kinds of variation. The main source of variation is going to be size or scale. So what's shown here are two different individuals and what those polar coordinate representations look like. And you can see they're actually quite similar. It's a bit hard to tell them apart. Or well, for instance, two different words produce quite different quite similar uh, representations. What's shown in the third row is a scaled version of the second. So the model has to learn to treat these two as the same individual while treating that as a different individual, even though the input of that individual is much more like this than the scaled version is, okay? So, um, and in fact, some of the recognition like Recognizing this as the word bag uh, is actually quite challenging. The way the model's trained is we present it with a, one of these visual inputs scaled in a certain way, and the model has to activate a unit corresponding to the identity of that, whether it's a word, face, or house. And in addition, for words, we force it to activate a, a unit representing the identity of the word, but only in the left hemisphere, so that left, so that there's a pressure for words to specialize in the left hemisphere because they need to be, they need to uh, serve certain language functions. So the actual architecture of the model has this visual information of some scaled input. It maps up to this intermediate level of representation. Each square here is a kind of artificial neuron. The, the, the gray level depicts the degree of activation of that artificial neuron. And then those project both up to these identity units where both hemispheres can contribute, but also the language units that only the left hemisphere contributes. Okay? Now there's one further important constraint in the model, which has to do with this, this constraint on locality, which is when these um, intermediate units, what I've labeled fusiform, left and right fusiform, when they receive information from the input below them, they're biased spatially to listen to only a certain range of eccentricity. Basically, the, uni the, the inputs that are right below them, okay? So these units on the left here of this group are strongly biased toward listening to just th these units Whereas a little bit further over, that's what these little triangle things are su supposed to denote. Um, units further over are listening to a different set of information. That is, the model is spatially constrained in the kind of representations it develops, in supposedly uh, in a way analogous to how the brain's constrained to use local connectivity. 
Um, I'll show you some evidence for how the model does that in a second. The model is trained to recognize these faces, words, and houses. Each, each of them at each scale is presented repeatedly. What's shown here is the performance of the model in activating the correct identity unit over the course of training. Um, and what you can see is basically it takes a while, but eventually the model is fully accurate. Um, in this work, we're not looking at acquisition per se, and so I'm not going to make a big story. One reason the house's accuracy is, is earlier to come in is simply there are fewer of them in the simulation. The idea is we know many more, we can recognize many more people than we can recognize buildings. Um, and so it's just a, not as rich of a domain. But essentially what I want to show you is by the end of training, the model is fully accurate at recognizing each of these stimuli uh, across variations in scale. Um, what, these, what this shows are the, where each of these intermediate units is listening to and who it's projecting to, what units it's projecting to. So this little yellow outlined unit, you can see its weights here where positive weights are red and negative weights are blue. You can see that it's listening to a particular range of eccentricity, mostly in central vision. And its weights going to the top layer, in this case, mostly are talk, it's mostly talking to word units. So this unit is really participating largely in word recognition. If you look at a unit on the right here, where it's more peripheral, that is to say more to the right, its weights come, of course, from peripheral visual information. And now, although it talks a little bit to the words and faces, it's largely making distinctions among the houses. And so these units are listening to smaller, a range of uh, spatial locations uh, in the central, in uh, the visual information. To evaluate the learned specialization, um, I'm going to uh, try to approximate performance in the brain damage patients, the prosopagnosics and the visual, the pure alexics. And I'll do that by lesioning the model. That is to say, temporarily removing some of the units of the model and then testing its performance on all the stimuli and measuring its performance in, on these different classes. But the lesions are going to be spatially constrained. In the brain, strokes usually damage a local area in the brain. And so to approximate that, what we'll do is we'll remove temporarily three columns of units, in this case, six units in total. So each lesion will always be of the same severity, but its location will differ. It will vary either in the left hemisphere or the right hemisphere, and it will vary in terms of whether it affects the region of the fusiform receiving information from central vision or a bit of both or, the, or peripheral vision. So we'll measure performance, and I'll show you the performance of the model as a function of the eccentricity of the lesion okay? for each hemisphere separately. So this is performance. Remember, the undamaged model is perfectly correct on everything. This is performance following lesions to the left hemisphere, fusiform, as a function of central lesions on the left here or peripheral lesions on the right. And what you can see is, for words in blue, a very strong effect of lesions near central vision in the fusiform lower performance to about 50% correct relative to the other categories. So that's like a lesion to the word form area impairing word recognition. But note, although houses are unaffected, faces are partially impaired. They're not as bad as words, but there's a, a moderate impairment. Um, and peripheral lesions aren't affecting either of these very, any of these very much. If we look at lesions to the right fusiform, now, central lesions impair faces in red much more than the others, although again, in parallel, the words are showing a moderate level of impairment. So there is specialization for faces and words. Words are most impaired by left lesions. Faces impaired most by right lesions. But there's a graded degree 
of impairment. So even the other category is partially affected. Um, I'll also note in passing that more peripheral lesions in the right hemisphere impair house recognition relative to the other two categories. And that turns out to be analogous to lesions to this parahippocampal place area, which is in more peripheral regions, as I showed you earlier, and uh, is largely restricted to the right hemisphere. So the model illustrates how a system that learns under these pressures develops representations that have graded specialization. Both hemispheres are participating, but there's some specialization in the left for words and right for faces. Now, if this story, if this theory has some validity, then it leads to certain predictions about how faces and words should behave uh, together in the brain um, that are counterintuitive in the sense that the domains seem unrelated. Okay, so most theories don't have anything to say about both faces and words. But this one says, because of these constraints on learning, they actually are related, okay? So I'm gonna to touch on a couple of these predictions. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over the domain generality. It's simply a demonstration of how lesions to the left hemisphere affect not just word processing, but visual processing with increasing complexity uh, in general. And I'll um, now focus on the last two, bilateral participation uh, and competition. So as I showed you in the model, the model makes the prediction that if we examine patients with word or face deficits, patients that have primarily face deficits should, that is to say prosopagnosics, should also have milder but reliable word deficits. And similarly, pure lexics should have milder face recognition deficits. So we examine this in a set of patients that have left fusiform lesions uh, that are pure lexics or right fusiform lesions. Uh, in fact, we also examined uh, two patients that are two individuals, I should say, that don't have frank lesions but are what are called congenital prosopagnosics, that are, say, individuals who have abnormally bad face recognition but don't have a, an explicit lesion. Um, in other work, uh, my colleague Marlene Berman has identified abnormalities in the projections from the fusiform face area to other uh, areas involved in face processing, but not in the fusiform itself. Um, we examine the performance of these two classes of patients, both on word processing and on face processing. So for word processing, this is, this is reading aloud, and in red is the standard finding with pure lexics of an increase in latency, that is to say a progressive slowing as a function of the length of the word compared to controls who show a very small, if any, reliable effect, okay? Um, what's shown in green here, though, are prosopagnosics, face, patients with face impairments that are showing an elevated slope. Not as bad as the pure lexics, but certainly reliably worse than control subjects. Um, this is uh, even clearer if we look at lexical decision, that is to say, deciding if a letter string is a word or not. Again, pure lexics show a strong length effect, controls show essentially none, and prosopagnosics are showing an intermediate level of impairment. If we turn to faces, we can ask uh, individuals to discriminate two faces, is either the same or different, and we can morph one face into another to alter the difficulty of the discrimination. So we can take two faces that are different, may be a little hard to see, and we can mix, we can create mixtures that are partially of one face and a little bit of the other, so that we can make it extremely difficult to tell them apart by taking, say, face A and adding in only 33% of face B. So it's a lot like face A as well. So we can adjust the difficulty of the face discrimination in a very quantitative way compared to identical trials. And if you look at the errors that these patients make, controls shown in blue, um, there's a kind of a hint of a difficulty effect overall. 
you can see that the prosopagnosics in green are really quite impaired. And again, as predicted, the pure lexics, word impairments, are also showing an intermediate level of impairment here in face discrimination. Not quite as bad as the prosopagnosics, but substantially worse than normals. Um, the same is true in their latencies, the time it takes to make these decisions. Here, in fact, at least for the easy and medium, the prosopagnosics and the pure lexics are uh, basically identical. Um, but again, even here, controls are, are showing an effect of difficulty, but the pure lexics are showing a partial impairment uh, as predicted by the model. Oops, sorry. So let me shift to another prediction the model makes, which has to do with the relationship in between face and word processing in the two hemispheres. So um, in one task, we looked at a match to sample task. So we present two faces and then a target face. And you have to decide with, whether that target face matches one of the two original faces. And in this case, it matches. And the match stays in the same hemifield, right? They're both on the left. The brain has a crossed organization, so that left information projects origin initially to the right hemisphere. Um, and so it, I'll show you, it'll turn out that when the match is in the left field, there's an advantage in doing the comparison relative to a case shown here on the right where the match crosses the field, OK? So you can do the same experiment with words. Here the word matches and it stays in the same field versus the match having to cross the field. So individuals, these aren't brain damage subjects, these are just normal college students, show an advantage in comparing faces when the match is in the left field, sorry, the right, hem the right field, sorry, for faces, this is the faces, for the left visual field, projects to the right hemisphere. They show an advantage for faces. So you can see the, the difference between these two cases. Um, you can get this advantage, uh, you have better performance in left versus right. You're also a little slower if it's between versus within. Analogously, you find a right field advantage, that is to say a left hemisphere advantage, for words doing this comparison. Okay, So that's standard. The, que the interesting question is, is there any relationship between these findings? Of course, the magnitude of the face advantage in the left field and the magnitude of the word advantage in the right field will vary across individuals. Do they have anything to do with each other? And the answer is yes. That is to say, the subjects that are more lateralized, that show a stronger lateralization for faces, also show a stronger lateralization for words suggesting that the two are in competition. In some individuals, they've resolved the competition into a more bilateral organization for each. In other individuals, there's been greater competition. And so when there's strong lateralization of one, there's also strong lateralization of the other. These aren't, again, independent domains. They seem to be in competition. In more recent work, we looked at a slightly different paradigm here. And now we're looking in development. Um, in this paradigm, although the same basic finding holds, we present a face centrally and then later do a match that's either in the left or the right hemisphere. Again, subjects are saying same different. And again, if you look in adult subjects, when that target is in the right hemisphere, you're much better, sorry, in the right field, you're better for words than faces. You're better on words when the target's in the right field relative to the left that is to say left hemisphere. And conversely, you're better for right, left field for faces. So that's just a replication of what I showed you earlier uh, in this new paradigm. Um, what was interesting to us, though, was to look at ch younger children, uh, seven to nine year olds, and adolescents, 11 to 13 year olds. And what we found is that in these younger children, whose overall performance is worse than the adults, they actually already showed the lateralization effect for words, but did not yet show a lateralization for faces. And in fact, even at 11 to 13 years, although now 
actu accuracy, yeah, accuracy is equivalent to the adults, who are college students, they, yet they still didn't show a lateralization effect for faces, suggesting that the word lateralization actually comes into play earlier, driven, we think, by language organization, and that the face organization is actually a response to that. That is to say, as the words become stronger and stronger in the left hemisphere, there's greater competition in that hemisphere against the word representations, whereas the word representations in the right hemisphere are not competing as much. And so there's a gradual shift in lateralization. It's not like, I mean, if anything, you would have thought the, word, the faces would be the dedicated module, right? They're evolutionarily much older. You're processing them from birth. But in fact, they are not the ones that are, that, they are not the class that is lateralized first here. Rather, their lateralization seems to be a response to the lateralization of word processing. And that's very much in, consistent with the way the model's working, that the models need to access left hemisphere language information is what drives word organization, and that subsequently drives face organization. Now, um, we looked at one other signature of this relationship, which is you can uh, relate the degree to which face processing is lateralized. It turns out it's related to reading skill. So across the children, both groups together, if you just measure reading skill, it turns out that as, as the child is getting better and better at reading, we think of that as a, an assay for how well developed their word representations are, that predicts the degree to which their face system is lateralized. So again, domains that you would have thought are independent actually turn out to be or seem to be interdependent. Um, now, before concluding, let me just mention some ongoing work using functional brain imaging, trying to examine in more detail the neural representations of faces and words and the degree of overlap of them in the two hemispheres. This is actually work uh, looking only in the left hemisphere using multi-voxel pattern analysis to find voxels, small regions in the brain, that can, be that can be used reliably to distinguish identities of faces, that is to say, the individual across variations in expression, or the identities of letter strings across variations in font. Okay? So what's shown here are in this left fusiform region, the voxels that are informative for word identity, that's green, face identity in yellow, and voxels that are actually informative for both in red. And what you see is there's a pretty good mixture. Yes, there are regions, there are voxels that are just doing words, but in the left hemisphere, there are also ones doing faces. And there seem to be a reasonable number of them that are doing both, right? So one possibility for the intermixing of face and word processing is that the systems are actually not related. They just happen to be packed into the same part of the brain. Okay? But these kinds of analyses suggest that there are, we're not quite down to the level of single neurons, but we're down to the level of you know, millimeter cube size, relatively small numbers, 100,000 or 10,000 neurons maybe. At least at that scale, there seems to be a, a a measurable amount of intermixing of information about faces and information about words, suggesting that there may be, even down to individual neurons, something about the mechanism where those neural mechanisms are actually contributing to both tasks. It's not definitive yet, but we're, we're, the evidence we have suggests even a, a considerable degree of intermingling at this detailed level. Okay, so let me conclude. There's a lot of data suggesting these dedicated modules for these different domains. And what I've tried to show you 
is that you can understand those data. Those data really do reflect specialization, but the specialization is partial. It's not as absolute as the modular story would lead you to believe. Okay? So the first, the first claim is the specialization is partial, not absolute. The second claim is we can understand that organization, that partial organization, as arising through principles of neural learning, basic assumptions about the, the pressures on how neural systems organize. There's a pressure for related information to be nearby. There's a pressure against competing representations to be represented close by. Related information has to talk to each other. If you instantiate these principles, in a neural-like system and train it on domains where faces and words place particular demands on central vision, then the resulting organization has the observed type of specialization. That is, faces are mostly in the right, words are mostly in the left, but it's mixed. And that mixing leads to predictions, both with regards to face processing impairments in pure lexics, word processing impairments in prosopagnosics, uh, correlations in the hemispheric lateralization across individuals. Um, those kinds of predictions follow as consequences of this particular computational theory, but don't really have a clear explanation if words and faces are separate independent domains. Okay? So, what I've tried to do is illustrate the value of taking theoretical ideas and instantiating them in explicit computational simulations and then using the consequences of those simulations to generate empirical predictions that we can then test with normal subjects, patients, and through functional imaging. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we have time for questions. So I would like to welcome any of the audience members. If you have questions, please do come to the stage where I'm standing. There's two red pieces of tape here up on the stage to let you know where to stand. Should I still stand here? I, I'm sort of in the light of the projector. Is that okay? Yeah, you're fine. Um, thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, really nice to hear your description of competing pressures and how that leads to specialization in how our brain develops. Your one point about development I thought was particularly intriguing. You said uh, that seven to nine-year-olds have not yet developed that lateralization for faces in how they process faces, which I thought was really interesting. And you said that it seems like it's a result of the fact that the brain lateralizes for words first and that that possibly is a result of our drive for understanding language and that that exists in the left hemisphere. So could that mean that for adults who have never read, um, understanding that not all languages have a written form, could that mean that these people who do not use a written script representation would then not develop that sort of lateralization for facial processing? Very good question. We actually have been trying to test this. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I think that's exactly right. Now, our developmental data suggests there's a delay in the lateralization of faces. And um, we think you can explain the eventual lateralization as a response to the earlier lateralization from words. And if that's true, then as you say, someone who hasn't learned a written language whether they're illiterate or they, they you know, however, uh, whether it's an English illiterate or a language that doesn't have a written script, should show in the, in the 
full form, no lateralization for faces, or certainly a reduced lateralization. Um, so we've been um, trying to test this in, in two respects. One is English uh, adults uh, who are functionally illiterate. The problem there is that um, even if you're illiterate, you are in a culture where there is extensive written visual information. So you may still be looking at words um, often. Uh, and, uh, and so it's not quite as uh, extreme. So we've also been trying to arrange to test individuals who come from a culture where there really isn't a written form. So it turns out Pittsburgh is a center for the relocation of some Somali refugees, mostly women whose husbands have died in fighting women and children, and many of whom have never learned a written language nor ever been in a culture until coming to Pittsburgh uh, that has written language. Um, and we've been trying to work with the Pittsburgh agency um, to examine their face processing in lateralization, and certainly in a way that's as um, you know, non-invasive and, and such as follows. It's, ethically, it's a very difficult thing to arrange because such individual, you know, such individuals don't understand what you know, informed consent means and, and what culturally what, uh, what's being asked of them. So it's a very subtle, um, sensitive kind of thing to arrange. But, the, but we completely agree with your claim, with the prediction that comes from our ideas that such the face processing of such individuals ought to, have, ought to be less lateralized and potentially better in the sense that if you think of face and word processing as in competition, if now face processing is not subject to that competition, potentially larger regions of the brain are dedicated to face processing and may actually have become better developed than an individual that's also literate. A little hard to know what the right control comparison is there. Um, but we're, we're trying to test this, something like that. Maybe I can also just mention briefly that, of course, deaf individuals have different both language and face experience that might have implications for the organization. So faces provide both linguistic and non-linguistic information. So the, it's, you know, the degree to which it's only words that are providing language-related information is, I think, reduced in a deaf signer. Um, and moreover, uh, the pressure for word reading to be lateralized might be reduced somewhat insofar as it's not accessing or primarily um, accessing spoken phonology, which is one of the most strongly lateralized aspects of language. And so I think there are implications um, for a range of uh, types of experience with language and visual uh, processing that, uh, that these ideas have implications for. Hi there, my name is Wei, and I wanted to ask um, about who exactly you have been running these tests on. Are they hearing individuals or deaf individuals, and then also are they strictly from the U.S., or are they also from other countries? So all of the, all of the work I've talked about specifically are hearing individuals, um, I believe some of them might be Canadian, but they're North American. Um, and uh, some of them have particular patterns of brain damage. Others are just normal college students. So um, we haven't yet extended these paradigms to look at deaf individuals. But as I mentioned, I think there are some interesting implications with regards to lateralization and potentially efficacy, that is, um, there's some evidence that certain aspects of face processing in deaf individuals is actually enhanced because of their way that they use that information in signing. Um, and it would be interesting to, to 
see whether those effects are consequences of these kinds of principles, this kind of learning system. Great. Uh, the reason I ask is because I'm from China, and uh, my experience with the deaf community there is that there isn't as much language displayed on the face. We show our affect and our emotions in other ways. So I'm wondering if the community there would respond, or even just the hearing community, because the hearing people there don't, aren't very visually expressive on their faces. So I wonder if the results that you would get from looking at that population would be much like what you're seeing here with the North American population. It's an interesting idea. Cert I mean, certainly the extent to which there are cultural differences in how information is communicated by the face and what that, whether that's related to language or not would be expected to alter how the system learns. So if, let's say, a face is less informative, it, it will still be highly informative for who the individual is. But some of the pressures on face processing relate, as you say, to expression and, and discerning emotion. And it could be that, as you say, in some cultures, the face is less important and that information is communicated in other ways. Potentially, then, the demands on central vision are somewhat altered. And that might lead to a somewhat different organization. Thank you. Um, yeah, because I've seen definitely cross-culturally that Europeans gesture with their hands a lot. Americans don't use their hands a lot, but they definitely use their facial expressions to convey information. And both of those patterns are different than what I've seen across Asia. Hmm. Um, it seems like, you know, the most you might see in Asia is just a slight furrowing of the brows, and that might be the extent of it. You don't see um, a great deal of change, and it doesn't necessarily indicate a degree of anger. It's just emphasis, so definitely mm -hmm. some differences there. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Well, thank you. hypothesis of uh, competition as one of the driving factors that gives rise to lateralization is absolutely fascinating and uh, we'll be talking and discussing that a lot. It's quite rich. Um, I was very interested in your um, voxel analysis where you had uh, some uh, swatches of the tissue that's so clearly, um, yes, that one, where you have the um, words and then faces being quite discreet in um, the groups of neurons that would be processing that. And then you have the overlap, those mm -hmm. that, and so I'm curious about that. Mm -hmm. What are they, how is it possible that they're overlap? How did they start? Why didn't they get impacted by those selection pressures? Um, did they just sit dormant? Or are they supposed to be equipotential? Um, Chicken and egg kind of question. Right. Um, it's true that it's a little bit puzzling because, as I argued, the kind of visual description you would want to give a word is very different than what you would want to give a face. And so whatever neurons are representing, it's, it's sort of hard to think about some feature that would be useful for both. Um, and, and, and there is a certain degree of segregation between them so that although there are, there are face informative voxels in the left hemisphere. You know, maybe they're just doing faces and they're not doing words. Um, of course, the overlap suggests, at least at a certain level of granularity, the neurons are, are contributing to have information about both. It still could be that at a neuron by neuron level, they are only contributing substantially to one domain, but, um, and that the, the segregation is only kind of partial. Um, but there, it seems to me the pressure on locality would be such that um, the surrounding neurons that would only be domain specific would have recruited them to kind of go one way or the other. There are a lot of examples of systems where, for instance, um, in uh, uh, 
uh, ocular dominance columns where you have information from the left eye and information from the right eye in a primary visual cortex. A lot of computational systems explain how these cluster into these stripes and segregate. And in those models, the segregation is quite strong. So my own sense is that um, if there is this kind of overlap, there probably is something functionally common, that there are certain aspects of face representation and, op and word representation that can, that, that, you know, certain kinds of distinctions can contribute to both. Certainly both domains have parts. They both have parts where the individual parts are quite similar and there's sort of relation, you know, subtle relations in words. It's mostly letter order. In faces, it's much more metric information. You, you can start to tell stories. I don't think I understand this enough. And I, I actually think that the only way to really understand it is to develop simulations that process much more realistic stimuli, right? So if we have a, a, a simulation that can recognize, you know, real faces and real words of a reasonable vocabulary, we could then ask, when that system's learning to do both, does it come up with units that participate in both? Are there some of these shared functions? So I think the, the, the simple simulations we've done to date can't, can't get at that yet. We have to do things that are more realistic. But it's very intriguing, I agree. Any other questions out there? Okay, seeing none, then again, we uh, just want to thank you so much, Dr. Plout, for your wonderful presentation. Really beautiful, rich, and theoretical information and ideas. Thank you for sharing it with us. My pleasure. Thank you. This has been a production of Gallaudet University.